He has authored more than 60 public publications, which have been cited in an aggregate of 1400 plus times in the scholar scholarly literature, as well as by SCOTUS and in Amikai briefs. He's testified extensively in high stakes cases, including insanity defense involving differential between delusional disorder and extreme political beliefs. The model he is presenting today was developed in response to those types of evaluations. I already told uh, Dr. Cunningham that I am personally very excited for this talk today. And so Dr. Cunningham, we're so grateful for you to be here today. Again, you've already presented for our series before. So we appreciate you donating yet another two hours of your time to be here. So thank you so much. And on behalf of UNM, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you. Good, thanks, Simone. So just to orient me, is this a one hour or two hour slot? Uh, we have a one hour, so we go okay. for one hour. Okay, that's good. You said two hours, and I thought, well, oh, gee, I need, I need more. I, know, I might need more. I might need more slides. No, I just give you credit for logging on before and troubleshooting, okay. and then staying for questions. You know, we we recognize it's more than just the hours that you're right, donating good, to us. Good. So thank you. Good. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, it, it's my pleasure to uh, to be here and uh, talk to you about a topic uh, that I have found uh, to be uh, particularly interesting. And so I, I appreciate your time and indulgence and uh, confidence. Uh, standard uh, issues, I have no financial relationship uh, to this program. The views that are expressed are my own and don't necessarily reflect views, policies, or positions of the University of New Mexico. Uh, our learning objectives today uh, are for you to be able to identify the diagnostic criteria for delusional disorder uh, to identify factors that render this differential more challenging, uh, to list the seven primary areas of analysis for making this differential, uh, and have the ability to access the 17 factors that are a part of these seven arenas uh, that, that provide a model of analysis for making this differential, and then also to recognize how diversity factors uh, may impact this uh, differential as well. Uh, the essential reference uh, for this presentation that I'm doing today is a paper that I authored for the Journal of Threat Assessment and Management of 2018. Uh, and it uh, describes the, the history of delusional disorder, this different, the challenges to the differential, uh, outlines the factors uh, and the 17 subfactors. Uh, that are a part of this, uh, including a nice little section at the end of the paper where uh, th this uh, seven arenas, 17 factors are presented in a very uh, abbreviated, discreet way, something you could print out and have as a reference uh, is a, a checklist to you. Uh, the, the, a PDF of the paper is available from Simone and the folks at University of New Mexico. Uh, or you can email me and I'm glad to send that out to you uh, in PDF. Uh, this presentation today is not a substitute for reading that paper if you're gonna try to employ this model of analysis uh, that, I've, uh, that I'll be presenting. So I'm gonna be hitting some of the highlights of it, not nearly with the, with the fine grained detail and orientation that the paper reflects. So I, I recommend uh, and, and direct you to that. Uh, th there is a, that we're talking about this continuum of conventional beliefs on one end and then overvalued ideas or extreme beliefs. And then at what point do these become delusions? At what point does this become a delusional disorder? And that differential is particularly challenging when the delusions have political or social ideology or religious uh, uh, elements uh, to them. Now, the slides are also going to be available in PowerPoint to you uh, after the presentation is over. So don't feel a uh, uh, demand to have to take notes as we uh, proceed with this. There is a, uh, a saying from Henry David Thoreau that, that is kind of a mantra that I try to keep in mind as I'm involved in doing evaluations back when I was in clinical practice primarily, and now as I'm, in, as I'm doing forensic consultations. And that's 
It's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. And so in my work, I'm always trying to, uh, to, to consider, are there additional perspectives that will let me see this more completely or more deeply? Uh, and, and part of that is because that's, that's, a, that's, that's what makes this work interesting is to continue to grow in your perspectives uh, about it. Uh, you know, partly because as a professional, I want to have the experience of a hundred cases, not one case a hundred times, where my perspective about what I'm looking at never evolves or grows or becomes deeper uh, over time. And so it's my, uh, it's my hope that our discussion of this and your consideration uh, of this model will assist you in what you see as you look at these cases and how to look at them from a number of perspectives and angles. Uh, these are our seven workshop elements. Uh, uh, we'll begin, the, the, this model is, a, is essentially a tale of two cases, uh, Brian Nichols case and, and the, the need for a structured professional judgment tool that I began to realize in the course of that. Subsequently in the Chris Montfort case, we'll talk briefly about the history of delusional disorder as a diagnostic classification, factors that contribute to diagnostic divergence, this notion of extreme overvalued beliefs and the extent to what, whether that helps us or not as we make that differential. Uh, and then this model of analysis uh, that I have uh, proposed. Uh, so the, the, this, uh, this model first took roots in the case of Brian Nichols in Atlanta, Georgia. And you may recall that Brian Nichols was on retrial in Atlanta for the rape, kidnapping, and assault of a former girlfriend. And that offense had, had taken place in March 2005. Uh, he had a hung jury at trial. Immediately, they start up with a new trial, like, you know, the Monday after the Friday that the jury was hung. Uh, on that morning, he overpowered an escorting female a jail officer, uh, uh, accessed her gun locker with her key, uh, went into the judge's chambers, came out from the judge's chambers out onto the bench behind the judge, uh, shot to death the, providing, the presiding judge, shot the court reporter, uh, fled the courthouse. He's in civilian clothes because this, this is the start of this new trial. Uh, out on the street, he, he is in a firefight with a sheriff's deputy uh, that he kills. Uh, there's quite a manhunt in, in uh, the downtown Atlanta. Uh, and he uh, ultimately gets out, hijacks a couple of cars trying to get away, uh, ultimately gets out to the suburbs on the BART, takes refuge in a house that's under construction. Uh, and that night, the, the homeowner who's having this house constructed comes to see what progress has been made on the building that day. Uh, this it, it turns out to be an armed federal officer uh, who is the homeowner, and uh, Nichols uh, shoots and kills him, uh, and then ultimately goes to trial in 2009. So that's kind of the, the, the structure of, of this case and the events. And, and then I'm just gonna give you a flavor of some of how, uh, of, of Brian Nichols' perspectives that first raised a question about whether or not he had a significant mental disorder uh, that was driving these, uh, these incidents. And, and here's what he, expressed as he is giving a statement to the police afterwards in this post-arrest interrogation. And he says, well, you know, let me just start off by saying that, you know, I give my condolences to all the families of those who were killed in combat. And with that being said, I felt as though the treatment of the prisoners in the Georgia state prison system paralleled significantly, significantly to that of slavery, the enslavement of people of African descent. And as you know, slaves have a tendency to rebel. And as a result, I felt as though it was my right as a human being 
basically to rebel as a slave. And I felt it was my right to declare war on the United States government. And that's what happened. And as you know, all the persons killed were employees of the United States government. There was no collateral damage. There was no civilian, there was no collateral damage, which sometimes happens in war. And as you know, I think, I think that the record should show that, you know, since it is my stance that I was at war with the United States government, that it should be noted there was no, no civilian damage. Okay, so what do you think? Is this a delusional disorder or does Brian Nichols simply have extreme beliefs? So comments, we'll take just a second here. Anybody wanna jump in with what they think about whether he has a delusional disorder or extreme beliefs based on this uh, admittedly very narrow biopsy and what metric you're responding to as you identify that. Anybody wanna jump in? Yeah, so please put your responses in the Q&A. Someone's already made a comment. So one person has said it's, it is noteworthy that two of his victims were black. Uh, another individual says not enough info from this data to make a determination. Um, somebody else says a third option would be that he is right. They're saying they don't necessarily agree with that, but that's a third option. Uh, another option, another third option is it's a form of malingering. Uh, somebody else says extreme belief, but that it's based on my gut as a lawyer. And mm -hmm. then um, somebody else says, did he know the homeowner was a government employee? If not, that would lead me to believe delusional disorder because it's just incorporating that person into their belief system. Um, somebody else says extreme belief, didn't know the homeowner was a fed. Um, another third option is just sheer luck of being a governmental employee as the homeowner. Um, seems like extreme beliefs. He is basing his explanation on fact-based and historical issues. And then someone else says, sounds like a delusion uh, in that he seems to think that he is an actual slave, not just his ancestors. Then somebody else says extreme beliefs seems to be. So certainly convenient, get out of jail free card, somebody else says. And then someone says, I wish to know, whew, these things are moving too fast for me to, I wish to know how Nichols came to believe these extreme beliefs. I'm, an, I'm a cult expert. Um, I would say delusional disorder because it's an extreme reason not thoroughly thought through and the consequences not considered. And then somebody else says not enough information. I wouldn't feel comfortable without personally testing or, diag or diagnostic complication. Sure, sure. Okay, so let's pause. Um, those, those, yeah. are all, those are all great points and I appreciate folks jumping in and apologize if they didn't quite get to yours. So this is kind of, and admittedly, you have very limited information uh, about this. But this is then kind of the initial exposure that I have of, and, and it goes on at great length in this interrogation that raises issues uh, about this, of what's going on here and what metric can be applied to think about this systematically. What, what, how am I going to do this? How am I going to, to analyze what he's presenting, assuming that it's authentic, uh, and identify where this is on that continuum. And so as I, uh, uh, as I undertake a literature review about delusions and delusional disorder, lots of, lots of folks offering conceptualizations and ideas uh, about this. N nobody though is describing this in any kind of systematic way. There's no article that I could go to that says, okay, here are some things to think about as you're trying to differentiate between delusions and extreme beliefs. And so what I'm encountering then, as I'm reading all this literature about delusions is that there needs to be a mechanism that promotes a more systematic and qualitative analysis, not just for the field in general, but as I'm trying to figure out in this case, what's going on, and as I testify about this and explain my rationale and reasons, that, that there needs to be some sort of systematic or qualitative structure to this, 
that encourages a wide ranging careful review of empirically derived to the extent that there are or clinically observed factors that illuminate this differential and also that supports transparency of analysis and reports and testimony. In other words, that makes my thinking on this uh, obvious and transparent and clear where somebody can then cross examine me on it, uh, challenge it, uh, understand the basis of, of how I'm arriving at this. And so in response to this case in Nichols and review of the literature, I identified six areas or factors that would structure the that structured my analysis in Nichols. And the first is the idiosyncratic, improbable, or grandiose nature of the belief. Two, the gathering of evidence and supporting ideas. Three, a suspension of critical judgment about those ideas. Four, rigid adherence to belief despite evidence. Five, a willingness or compulsion even to act on the, the belief. And then in this case, there was personality testing uh, that interestingly had been performed, as I recall, by the state. Uh, and there were factors in it and that personality testing that I thought uh, illuminated some of the nature of his thinking. And so in this case, I thought that those personality testing findings had, uh, had some application. So that's, that's the, the structure that I identified uh, in Nichols. And then in the course of my testimony, his, his, of course, his statement was videotaped. And so as I talked about these different elements, uh, portions of, those, of this extended videotaped statement were played to the jury where they could hear him in light of this factor, uh, you know, along with seeing a, a written transcript on the screen as well. All right, so we fast forward to the case of Christopher Monfort, the next high profile case that I'm involved in that calls for this, dilute, this differential. And here's the Chris Monfort case. In October, 2009, Christopher Monfort firebombed Seattle police vehicles that were parked in a city maintenance yard. Now his plan was to draw law enforcement to the scene then relocate to a sniper perch on a nearby hillside and open fire, killing police officers. Uh, his exit, though, from the maintenance yard was observed by maintenance workers who saw what direction he went, so the sniping plan was aborted. Now, the reason that he was in the maintenance yard so long that he ended up getting observed is that he is placing flyers on vehicles within the maintenance yard on police vehicles. Uh, and so the, one of the flyers, a characteristic flyer says, October 22nd is the 14th national day of um, some protest to stop police brutality. And it says these deaths are dedicated to deputy Tav Travis Bruner. He stood by and did nothing as deputy Paul Sheen brutally beat an unarmed 14-year-old girl in their care. You swear a solemn oath to protect us from all harm. That includes you. Start policing each other or get ready to attend a lot of police funerals. We pay your bills. You work for us, American citizens. Uh, and you, you see that flyer underneath the wiper of this police vehicle. And then he also impaled the top of a police car uh, with an American flag. And here's what Chris Monfort said about why, why he did what he did uh, as he is approaching this Seattle police yard. I thought about the British and the founding fathers as I loaded the backpack and prepared my weapons. I had a sense of solidarity and connection to the founding fathers. It struck me how far we've come and how little we've gone. Most people have little sense of the connection to the founding fathers or what they did. All right, so in October, he firebombs the city maintenance yard. Then nine days later, he assassinated a Seattle police officer and wounded another. 
He's out cruising in his car looking for uh, pol police officers to kill, uh, going through a residential neighborhood, spots a patrol car sitting by the curb, comes back by and uh, shoots from his window, side window, into the side window of the police car, kills the police officer driver, uh, the other ducks down and uh, he, he doesn't kill her. And as he's leaving the scene, he drops this American flag as a symbol about why he did what he did. Uh, he is apprehended several days later. He has fortified his apartment, uh, you know, kind of bunkerized it. Uh, but then he, even though he's made that his bunker, he leaves. Uh, meanwhile, they've identified uh, him as a suspect. Uh, and as he's trying to get back, running down the outside hallway, uh, uh, but trying to get back to his apartment, uh, he is shot, hit in the uh, um, kind of lower chest area, spine is, he's paralyzed. He's also shot through the face. Uh, and then he goes to trial in 2015. Uh, and this is Chris Monfort at trial. Now, because of pain associated with the, uh, the spinal injury that he has, he is only able to sit for a little bit over two hours at a time. And so effectively, there's about an hour and a half of court in the morning and an hour and a half of court in the afternoon. And I'm on the stand during the insanity phase of, of this case uh, for about three weeks and have about 600 slides uh, that I've prepared to illustrate the analysis that I made of his uh, mental state at time of offense. Uh, one of the things that I did as a part of that and something that I would encourage you to do, I also did in Brian Nichols, uh, but would encourage you to do as you're trying to make this differential about extreme beliefs versus delusional disorder is that you actually write what those beliefs are, that, uh, operationalize them, distill them specifically. And so I'm going to read through these uh, for you. And then again, we'll pause at the, uh, at the conclusion for you to think about, okay, so given these, these beliefs, what do I think about these and, and what they mean and what metric am I going to use in trying to uh, decipher these? One, a growing conviction that the police in the United States and more specifically in Seattle and King County had departed from the legitimate exercise of their lawful authority and were acting in a tyrannical, brutal, raping and murderous fashion against the citizenry. Two, the police in their current role function as an officially sanctioned but criminal gang. Three, there are inescapable parallels between the Seattle and King County police, as well as the police in many other jurisdictions, and the British Redcoats leading up to the American Revolution, who he believed engaged in widespread pillage, assault, rape, and murder on the American colonial citizenry. Even those police officers who do not themselves engage in criminal assaults against the citizenry, uh, which he thought was about 50 to 55% of the local police force, are complicit because of their solidarity with the gang and their failure to police their own. Five, the criminal and murderous conduct of police officers represents the gravest threat to liberty and the most serious social problem confronting the United States. Six, it is an essential obligation of citizenry to resist such tyranny with deadly force, as was demonstrated by the founding fathers and other American colonial citizens. Seven, by his own singular action, he would fulfill this obligation and function as a modern minute man in rousing the rest of the populace to similar action in throwing off the yoke of police tyranny. Only when a sufficient number of police officers had been killed would police departments and district attorney offices act to restore the police to behaving lawfully 
and resuming their legitimate role of serving citizens. Nine, though recognizing that his offense-related conduct subjected him to arrest and prosecution under Washington law, he believed his plans, preparations, and actions in the charged conduct were not only morally right, but also consistent with the higher law of the Constitution of the United States. 10, his offense-related conduct was required of him as an American citizen under the Constitution. 11, thus his offense-related conduct was both morally right and lawful. Okay. So what's your opinion about whether this is a, a delusional disorder or extreme beliefs? And what factors are you applying as a metric? How are you, what, as you think about this systematically, what factors are you applying to get there? So the first now, person, we've got some responses already, if you want me to start reading them. Or yeah, you know, let, me, let me hold you just a second and I'm gonna give okay. you just a little bit of additional information. So who is Chris Monfort? Well, he has a biracial family of origin. He was abandoned by his father. He has a bachelor's degree from University of Washington. He's had kind of uneven employment, had thoughts of going to graduate school, has, no, has not had long-term dating relationships, no mental health history, no criminal history, and he's 40 years old. Broadly, as we think about his mind, his intellect, reason, decision-making, initiative, concentration, problem-solving attention, his sensorium is broadly intact. Let me give you a little bit more information. So there are some precursor kinds of things going on with him psychologically. He does have some social interpersonal interaction problems that you maybe got a hint of in his not having a long-term dating relationship history. And so it, as he goes about his life and in a college classroom, he's insensitive to social cues opinionated, rule-bound, rigid, idealistic, distrustful of government, has kind of poor coping capabilities, generally or broadly intimacy avoidant. So that's kind of this area of sort of social interpersonal issues that exist within this otherwise intact sensorium. And so now the question is, as these other things emerge, these, these 11 beliefs that I've operationally identified, are those delusional beliefs that have emerged out of that? Or are these simply extreme beliefs? Okay, so now, uh, Simone, let's hear, some, let's hear some, uh, some observations. Okay, so we have some that uh, already typed in before they got the additional information. So I'll read those anyways, just for frenzies. So well-developed, detailed, specific, coherent set of beliefs that unlie his actions. Behavior is direct result of these beliefs. That's one person. Next person says delusional disorder. Next person says grandiose, like the previous case, delusional disorder. Another person says extreme beliefs, unless the rape he mentioned uh, in the letter did not actually occur. Delusional disorder, again, based on, um, oh, things are moving. So I, again, based on his language, rather than the tenet of I feel, he stated in his note that he believes he is part of a group connected with the founding uh, founding fathers, I think. Uh, based on the logic used to justify actions and how he over incorporates factors into justification. So I think that's somebody who's like adding to something else. Connection with others with similar beliefs. Someone's asking that question. Uh, someone else says extreme belief points one, two, and four jive with my memory of SPD at the time. But the logical leaps and conclusions he makes from those observations are what drive it to be extreme. Um, next person says, I would say in this case, extreme beliefs, as I think he's too logical in his presentation. Uh, another person says extreme beliefs that are commonly shared by many in the relational to social justice and the tyranny of the police. He seemed to understand his actions and their consequences. Um, next person has like lots of questions maybe that they would want to know, like what is the timing of the beliefs? Has he spoken to about these beliefs to anyone else? What are his intellectual influences? What is the social support communities he belongs to? What social media is he consuming? So there's some additional questions that folks would like 
clarification on. Sure, all, th all different, yeah, different factors of analysis that might inform the metric. Good. Right. Do you want me to keep going? A uh, couple more. A couple more. Um, so here's another one that says, he became delusional to me when he said, if enough police officers are killed, they will start to behave lawfully and because he believes his actions are lawful and the relation to the American Revolution. Otherwise, I think it would just be extreme belief. So for this person, those extra pieces make it delusional. Okay, um, so let me, let me pause here. Now, please understand, as I listed these 11 things, Chris Montfort didn't write out a, a, a manifesto of his 11 beliefs. Instead, based on my interviews of him, observation of the video of the state's interview of him, uh, statements that he made to the police, courtroom statements that he's made. I'm distilling these 11 beliefs from that. Now, it's not a hard distillation to make because in talking to Chris, uh, as you would go along for a little while, he would shift into his kind of set spiel about all this stuff and start into a role and you'd redirect him and talk about something else then the spiel would start up again with, with much the same language. So it wasn't particularly challenging, but that systemization was one that I undertook. All right, so you remember that in Nichols, we had six arenas or factors that were specified to structure the analysis. And those were these six things. All right, so now I'm involved in Chris Montford. And so I go back to the literature and, and plus, after I testify in a case or even when I'm finished with it, it's not unusual for me to keep mulling that over and thinking about it some more. Uh, and so it, it kind of additional thoughts about it, sometimes cross-examination even brings, of course, different perspectives. She hadn't thought about quite that nuance to it. Uh, and so I went back to the literature uh, and now developed uh, eight arenas instead of six. And those are listed here on slide 47. We won't spend a lot of time going through those, but it has many of the same features uh, as the, uh, the, the prior six, but now expanded to eight. Now, these are conceptually derived. In other words, these are based on looking at the scholarly literature and discussions about delusions and delusional disorder and taking that literature and trying to operationalize it into these factors. Uh, and, and to illustrate, uh, so we've got our eight factor model on the left and we've got the way Jasper talked about delusions and delusional disorder uh, in 1913 as he cited in Huff 2006. Uh, or the Maudsley assessment of delusion schedule and how the eight factor model lines up to the factors that came out of the, this Maudsley assessment uh, scale, the MADS schedule. Uh, or Taylor and Felthouse in 2006 and how these different eight factors match to ones that they considered, or Bentel and Taylor in 2006, uh, or Junginger in 2006. Uh, so, uh, and then Junginger's method in 2006, uh, uh, giving additional ideas about this. Uh, so, in, in other words, the idea here being that out of this literature, I'm trying to distill in a way that can be forensically operationalized, uh, what factors I can look at to help make this differential. So ultimately, I mean, let me give you a flow chart for how I ultimately uh, conceived of what happened with Chris Montford. And it was my opinion uh, that he had a delusional uh, disorder. And, and here's the, the, kind of the, as I thought about how this developed in his psyche that there were anecdotal reports of police brutality that he was increasingly preoccupied with and looking at online, the video of police brutality incidents that he would, uh, would search for and spend a good deal of time looking at. And then he's a history major uh, in college. And so he's studying the American Revolution and has an idealization of the patriots and founding fathers. And, and out of this kind of ideational uh, construct, he begins to develop some idiosyncratic ideology, like the American Revolution, like the, like the Redcoats were the police force in colonial America, not true. 
that the Redcoats were routinely brutal to the colonists prior to the revolution. Also not true. And so these, he is, is uh, and that the current police brutality is like what the Redcoats were doing back in the American Revolution. So he developed some idiosyncratic ideology, essentially, that the police are today's Redcoats. And then we go from an idealization of the Patriots and Founding Fathers to a pathological identification with the Founding Fathers and those Revolutionary War uh, citizens that then invoked a grandiosity, as he's identifying with them, and an imperative to act. And out of this, he develops this irrational and, and then critical expectation that if enough officers are killed, that will constitute a tipping point of killed officers. Not that policing will become even more brutal, not that the American citizenry will line up even more behind the police because after now, after all, now they're being hunted, but instead it will reach this tipping point that will change everything. And so out of that then, uh, he engages in this delusion-induced right action. Now, this is something that is, is kind of fascinating about uh, these defendants, whether they have extreme beliefs or whether they have delusional disorder, is that routinely they think what they're doing is right. Now, in most of the criminal cases that we're engaged in, the person who's doing the crime knows that, that they're doing dirt, that, you know, they're robbing, they're drug dealing, they're got mad and they killed somebody. They recognize this is not morally right what I'm engaged in. What's interesting about these defendants is they think they're doing what's right and they may otherwise be conventional and good citizens in other respects. All right, so he, my conclusion was this was a delusion induced right action. Uh, now then with subsequent literature review, so, so then I'm, I'm uh, uh, so I present this in my testimony in Montfort and then it's subjected to cross-examination, which I, you know, that I think is some things, I, I thought I'd thought of everything, but there were things that made me kind of pause in cross-examination. And then the, the state called a mental health expert who said these were not uh, uh, delusions, these were simply uh, extreme beliefs. Uh, I had been asked on cross-examination if this model had been published and I said no although I hope to do some additional work on it and perhaps uh, you know, seek publication of it. Uh, the state's expert opined that this model was schlock and this would never be published. Uh, so of course that then stirred me uh, after the case to think about, okay, so is this something that, uh, that we can go forward with? So I did additional literature review, lots of discussions with Dr. Steve Golding who made uh, very important contributions in this matter rad 17 emerged looking at seven areas or criterion of analysis containing 17 factors. And so this is a model of analysis for differentiating delusional disorder from the radicalization of extreme beliefs or the mad or rad 17. And these are our seven criterion of analysis. These are the seven broad arenas. A, the cognitive content of the belief. What is believed? And that's part of, of the operationalizing this into discrete belief statements. B, the cognitive style of the belief. Not just what is believed, but how is it believed? C, the distress or social dysfunction associated with the beliefs. D, social influences. How are the beliefs inspired, maintained, and or operationalized into action by a social context? E, social inclusion. To what extent is the adherent socially integrated and productive? F, prodromal factors. What indications are there of a developing psychosis? And G, behavioral or activation factors is the belief acted on? How is the belief acted on or exhibited? What disturbance accompanies that action? 
So there are these seven arenas. Within these are 17 uh, uh, more specific factors. So within A, what is believed is idiosyncrasy, improbability, and grandiosity. Within B, how is it believed is rigid adherence, suspicion of critical judgment, preoccupation. Under C, distress and dysfunction is associated distress and functional impairment and a, the extent of associated social difficulty. Under D, the interaction with like believers, either in person or online. 10, social motivators. 11, social facilitation or tangible support. E, social inclusion. F, prodromal symptomatology. And then G, how is the belief acted on, has four factors, willingness to act, compulsion to act, rigid moral distinctions in acting on the belief, and psychological disorganization associated with the belief. All right, so we have seven criterion of analysis. Within these are embedded 17 factors. And then as you, as you uh, look at the paper, you'll see that within these 17 will be additional operational definitions or, or, or characteristics to help you understand or, or to think about, so what does preoccupation mean? How might preoccupation be exhibited? So th this is the mad or rad 17. Now, here's a limitation of this, or at least a, a or maybe not limitation, but it's an application that I ha have not, had not entirely thought through at the time this was published. Now, remember that this model is a tale of two cases. This is the Brian Nichols case and the Christopher Montfort case. Each of those involve somebody who is acting alone and has their own belief system. Although there may be elements of it that are shared by others, they're not in association with anybody. This is the, it's kind of a, a, this is a solo uh, uh, case and offense. Now, what this doesn't adequately deal with, or at least the applications of it are not sufficiently developed, is well, what about when it's not an individual delusional disorder? What about a shared delusional disorder? What about that? Now, of course, in a shared delusional disorder, you wouldn't have the extent of idiosyncrasy because other people in that group uh, or a dyad or triad or whatever it is, other people are sharing it at least to a limited extent. And as that shared delusional disorder arises out of uh, uh, interaction with others, kind of the essence of being shared, now our social factors are different too than they would be if we were talking about a simply individual delusional disorder. So this is an area that I am now contemplating and thinking more about, about how could this be illuminated. Um, uh, and, and it gets into an interesting notion, uh, both in terms of, of how we understand that. Shared delusional disorder also has a diagnostic history that goes back into the 1800s. It's also uh, talked about, and in, in, as I recall, ICD-11 ICD, uh, or 12. Uh, so so it, it has a, also has a diagnostic history to it. It gets more complex as the number of adherents increase. And this is something I'm also trying to think through about how does our understanding of individual pathology, how is that then affected if other people have similar pathology? Uh, so for example, if 20% of a population have an infection a certain disease, the COVID. Does that mean then that COVID is not a disease because 20% of the population have it? Does the number of people who suffer from it or share it, to what extent does that then affect our understanding of what it means to have psychopathology? So 
stay tuned. These are things that, uh, that I'm thinking about. I'm just letting you know, although this model is, is quite uh, uh, useful, I think, in differentiating delusions, as you move into a shared delusional disorder, you, you know immediately that the idiosyncrasy and the social factors are gonna be uh, different and there are likely to be additional ways to think about this. Okay. Uh, let's quickly go through the history of delusional disorder as a diagnostic classification, because I think this is critically important in having a clear conception of as diagnosticians about the entity that we're talking about here. And I'm going to uh, uh, bastardize the French, but uh, Esquel in the uh, 17, 1800s, French psychiatrist distinguished delusional disorders from the main body of insanity, like schizophrenia. And it referred to it as monomania, that these individuals are not wholly insane because they were in touch with reality on most things. These are partial insanities. He observed that these patients were logical. Earlier, somebody said, well, he showed too good a logic in thinking through this to have a delusional disorder. Well, Esquel is saying they're logical, they had accurate memories, they have lively curiosity. Where their ideas were odd or eccentric, they supported them with an appeal to evidence. Then Karlbaum talks about paranoia, that this is a term that should be used to specifically distinguish one of the partial insanities composed entirely of a coherent encapsulated delusional system. So this is like an encapsulated tumor. This person has an intact sensorium, except for this encapsulated tumor. Now there are some things like diabetes, you're sick all over, uh, or leukemia, widespread cancer. Alternatively, you might have an encapsulated tumor in a particular organ where the rest of your body functioning at that point is intact. Then Kreplin talked about a distinct illness where there's a chronic unshakable system of delusions that gradually develops while presence of mind and the order of train of thought are completely conserved. Kreplin is talking about this, where the rest of the mind is generally unaffected except for this encapsulated delusion. So outside of the delusional system, this person is not and does not behave in a stupid or bizarre or inefficient fashion. A Kreplin goes on to say that, that these delusions are largely confined to diseased interpretations of real events. So there are reality-based features that this is being built around, that they become extended to include events of recent date they're incorporating examples of this right up to the present and contradictions and objections are recognized and explained. But, so those historical conceptions are quite important in this. Now then delusional disorder is added to the DSM in, in 3R and included in the subsequent versions. And here's how DSM-5 describes delusional disorder a psychotic mental illness that involves holding one or more delusions. What's a delusion? Delusions are fixed beliefs that are not amenable to change in light of conflicting evidence. So we've got a psychotic mental illness that involves holding one or more delusions in the absence of other significant psychopathology, never met criteria for schizophrenia, generally hallucinations are not predominant, a person with delusional disorder can be quite functional and does not tend to show any odd or bizarre behavior, except when the delusional belief is being acted on. They look like this. So what's our prevalence rate? Well, people with delusional disease in the community don't typically present themselves for treatment. So we, there's a caveat as we look at this incident but I'm, I'm, on slide 74, we have lifetime prevalence 0.2%, point prevalence 0.03%, psychiatric patients 1% to 2%, correctional population about a quarter of a percent. So you're going to encounter this 
albeit uh, perhaps infrequently. All right, so again, we're gonna have a hard time on this, because of these features, there is gonna be diagnostic divergence. So what does that mean in a practical basis? Well, in both Nichols and Monfort, the defense retained expert, that would be me, diagnosed delusional disorder. The state retained expert asserted, no, asserted there was no delusional disorder, rather extreme beliefs. Well, what are the factors contributing to that? Well, remember that delusions are the sole distinctive feature in delusional disorder. And so now this person looks intact except for this. And even when acting on the belief, a mentally ill offender may exhibit planning and rationality. So simply because, so, so having a delusion does not make you stupid, does not make you illogical. Although sometimes we see some disorganization associated with the offense, not necessarily. And so now is an, an, an alternative expert is looking at this they're not seeing broad psychopathology. The behavior at the time of the offense was logical and rational. Uh, outside of that delusional system, this person is not stupid, bizarre, or inefficient. The delusions reflect content that's within the realm of possibility, which means there may be other people who hold some feature of this, making it really challenging to make this differential because in, in, in this left hand, in this Venn diagram on the left hand circle, the person with share with, with let's say the, uh, the ye large yellow circle is extreme beliefs. And the person holding these extreme beliefs, that's mostly what they think is the shared content of that shared belief system. The person with delusional disorder will share some of it but is likely to have more aspects of it that are idiosyncratic. They take it places that other people don't take it. And then there's limited scholarly guidance. So let me illustrate that. Here's what DSM says. The distinction between delusional and strongly held beliefs is sometimes difficult to make. Okay, thanks, that helps. And it depends on, in part on the degree which the conviction or the belief is held despite clear or reasonable contradictory evidence. I mean, that is very limited. So one of my favorite movies is Trading Places. Uh, you'll remember that Eddie Murphy gets picked up by the Duke brothers uh, as they bail him out of jail and are, are giving him cigars and alcohol. And, and Billy Ray leans up to the chauffeur in the front seat and he says, what's my next move, man? And the chauffeur shrugs his shoulders and Billy Ray says, thank you, you've been helpful. Okay, that's where I think that, that that's what I think of DSM-5. I mean, so how does this help? Uh, you know, there are delusional rating scales, those have significant limitations to them. Uh, and, and then also there are pressures on forensic objectivity in these cases for all sides. And that's again, part of why I think it's important to have a systematic metric that you're working through. Uh, the, the, you know, these, the nature of these cases and the media coverage uh, and even the extent to which the expert may identify with them, all of these pull, uh, pull on objectivity. Uh, now there's this notion of extreme overvalued beliefs. I also don't find this to be particularly helpful as a, as a conceptualization. Uh, you know, it, it, this is offered by Raman et al. in 2016. He pulls on earlier sources to talk about what an extreme overvalued idea is. Now, the, the problem is that delusional disorder shares most of those characteristics. And also, if you go back to these sources that Raman is drawing on, uh, one of the extreme overvalued beliefs is like a patient who doesn't believe that his arm is his and so is seeking surgery to have it removed. That's an overvalued idea as we look back at, at the conceptual origins of, of this notion. And so to me, overvalued idea is simply another terminology for describing an extreme belief. Doesn't really move the ball forward uh, in a significant way.
uh, which is why I then moved toward this, a more systematic, more elaborated model of analysis uh, with our seven criterion and 17 specific factors. And, and then very briefly, the, the, just one caveat about this. This is not a test that can be scored or a checklist that lends itself to item totaling that you say, okay, this person only had four of 17, therefore they're not a delusional disorder. That's not the intention of this at all. This is not a psychometric system that you can attach a score or total. Uh, this is instead intended to be a mechanism to help you think about these cases systematically and also to be transparent about that analysis as you would talk about them. Uh, now we're gonna be out of time uh, before I can illustrate the use of some applications of this with Monfort, I'll simply show you some photographs about his preoccupation uh, very briefly here at the end. And you'll, you have access to these slides uh, so you can see about it, the nature of his idiosyncrasy. So uh, in Chris's freezer, this is the, remember he had it for his house fortified as a bunker. In his freezer is a bottle of Applejack. Well, Applejack is the, um, is the brandy that George Washington drank. He even wrote to lot Robert Laird to get the recipe so he could make it himself. So it's important to Chris to drink the same thing that the founding fathers did. Uh, also illustrating his preoccupation, uh, this is his bedroom as they found it uh, with the American flags. Uh, these are the constitutions that are arrayed on his kitchen counter looking just like this. This is not a reconstruction for law enforcement. In fact, he has a, po a copy of the uh, constitution uh, in, his, in his pocket. Uh, I appreciate so much your attention uh, with this today and, and it's my earnest hope that this discussion and, and the thoughts that you may have about this model uh, help you see your cases uh, in a more complete way. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Cunningham. And uh, for those of you who are in a tight schedule, we are at just past right at the one o'clock mark. So the CEU link has been posted in the chat, so you can grab that. Um, but in the meantime, we are going to go through some of these questions of which we have numerous. Um, so the first question is, uh, someone's asking about the belief in conspiracy long measure. I think they're maybe perhaps asking about your opinion or if you're familiar with that measure, belief I'm in not. conspiracy long. I'm not. Um, the next question is regarding the Nichols Six Arenas Factors of SPJ tool. Uh, so the person wrote, gathering of evidence, supporting ideas is a normative process for developing knowledge and demonstrating critical thinking. Then they say cherry picking data is flawed, but not pathological. So they're asking in this tool, is there an assumption that gathering evidence is pathological? No, I mean, not necessarily. Um, this is simply another metric for thinking about where does this come from and how does this person go about sampling from the world around him to support a belief system? Um, as someone increasingly focuses on the data that is confirmatory and is more rigid and exclusionary about what's not conformatory, confirmatory, that increasingly is a disruption in reality testing. So all of us are sampling from, for data from the world around us. And this is, has to do with how does this person go about that? How is this believed and, and maintained? Um, now, any process of perception is going to be normative. We all use our eyes to look at the world around us. In the modern age, we all access the computer to get information. And so, so all of these things will be normative. It's not at all unusual for a delusion to have religious aspects. Well, gee, millions of people are religious. But see, this person takes that a different place in, in how they go about believing it. Next question. Okay, so the next one says, do you take into consideration 
how emotional they are when discussing the beliefs, um, how much they return back to discussing that belief, like perseveration, you know, returning to the idea repeatedly. So the person saying they imagine the primary distinction from extreme beliefs to perhaps delusional is that emotionally charged aspect of it, then also that perseveration, like just sort of inability to get off of the idea. Sure. So this goes to a couple of things. It goes to uh, distress or disturbance around the belief that may have some affective charge to it, uh, to the extent that there is a perseveration in content, as there was with both Monfort and Nichols. It goes to preoccupation. Uh, and as if they, once they get into this field, it's in a feedback loop that just goes around and around uh, and that they stay stuck there. Uh, again, it's not that, the, that these things may not also be uh, ex exhibited when someone has extreme thoughts, but it's that on a, on a continuum, this person goes there more strongly, stays stuck there more as they get there. Somebody else is asking about considering the rigidity of his delusional system, would he not resist an insanity defense? So what was the nature of your testimony? So I, I think there's also another question that I'm, I think I'm gonna loop into this one is sort of this idea of competency for, you know, and insanity. So if someone is still actively holding those delusional beliefs, you know, how do you deal with those issues? So I think there's two parts, right? If someone's still delusional or holds those beliefs so strongly, how do you move forward with an insanity defense? And then secondly, is competency then potentially an issue in those, in those types of cases? Yeah, so the, 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 let me uh, begin with the first question on, on uh, an insanity defense. Uh, so Chris Monfort was very much opposed to insanity defense, uh, as was Brian Nichols. Uh, because he actually believed, they, they actually believed these things and did not want them denigrated by pathologizing the person as irrational and psychotic who held this belief. What Chris came to understand is that the only way his ideas and motivations for doing this would come before a jury or be made public to the media was with an insanity defense. Otherwise, this is just a whodunit. Did you firebomb the police yard? Did you assassinate this officer? It is just an offense of whodunit. And only as an insanity defense could his ideas be fully expressed uh, and put out there, even if characterized as being irrational. Uh, now, uh, this was illustrated in the course of the trial. Uh, uh, I'm testifying along, and, uh, and Chris shouts out, bullshit. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you, but it's a little unnerving in terms of disrupting your train of thought. Uh, so I paused. And uh, the judge said, Dr. Cunningham, please continue. And so I kind of picked back up. Later, in fairness to Chris, later on, he said, yeah, that's right. But <laughs> I was making another point. All right, so that's uh, my, my recollect. I have the clearest recollection of that in Monfort. And I think there was a similar dynamic that happened in Nichols in terms of uh, uh, this is the only vehicle by which this belief system will be made public. Uh, and otherwise, it'll just be a whodunit. Um, the competency issues in both of these cases, um, you know, in the Nichols, it was, it was uh, you know, somewhat more problematic because uh, he thought that his judge was also part of this slave master uh, court prison slave work system. Um, in fact, that's a question the judge asked me at the conclusion of my testimony of, does Mr. Nichols believe that I'm a slave master and that my court reporter is the slave ma is a slave master's assistant? And uh, I said, yes, he does. So afterwards, uh, we were talking about the attorneys who were saying, well, why, why was he asking you that? And I said, he's trying to perfect his record. 
He thinks that the jury may well find Brian Nichols not guilty by reason of insanity, and he needs to have a clear, unequivocal statement that this man continues uh, to be dangerous and holds belief systems that could represent a hazard uh, to the court and the public. And so he gets an overt statement from me uh, to that effect that he can then use to uh, maintain custody of Brian Nichols without convening another hearing about that. Because uh, the state's testimony doesn't help him because the state's expert is saying he doesn't have a delusional disorder. There's no, there's no commitment that would come out of the state's uh, analysis of him. Um, in both of these instances, uh, ultimately the defendants were cooperative with their defense and allowing an insanity defense to be presented. Uh, you know, Brian Nichols had some difficulties comporting himself in the courtroom. Ultimately, that didn't uh, completely work against him as the jury can see kind of how he's operating and the nature of his beliefs. And it does have a very authentic aspect to it that pushes against that he's just malingering. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's another whole issue about what do you do with competency uh, with people that don't believe in the legitimacy of the court because of some, uh, you know, uh, with their belief system. So there's a, a sort of a number of people have a similarly themed question, which is sort of like this idea of um, how you apply this to these groups of individuals that share ideas, right? So like the rioters from the January 6th um, protest that, you know, truly believe they were doing the right thing. Uh, you know, other folks saying that there's hundreds of people within their area that believe the same things about police that perhaps, you know, these defendants are speaking of. So what, what are your thoughts about that? You know, kind of the, the idea of, I know it goes beyond what, what your measure is designed to, but sort of this like group-based delusional or, or, or shared belief systems and how that impacts, you know, the delusional versus extreme or, you know, that kind of Sure. So, so first, I'm not surprised if delusional content pulls from reality-based events, from religion, from politics. Uh, you know, if someone who's raised in Ireland who has religious delusions, it probably has Catholic Virgin Mary kind of themes to it, not Hindu themes. And so we, the, the delusions are constructed by what's socially salient to this individual. And so part of the issue with idiosyncrasy, and, and you can read more about this in the paper, is the extent to which not that some elements of it are shared, but the extent to which this person takes this places that other people don't necessarily take it. Uh, and so in, in both of these instances, uh, uh, although there are lots of people that are suspicious, uh, you know, or believe there's a prison industrial complex or that kind of thing, you know, Brian Nichols is taking this some additional places. He is thinking that the people running the prison systems and the courts are the direct physical descendants of those slave owners. Uh, uh, you know, if it's, if it's uh, Chris Monfort, this notion of there being a tipping point of officers to be killed. Now also remember that Montfort is before Black Lives Matter. This is before the police issues, you know, have this national presence uh, uh, to them. He predates uh, uh, that. And so there is concern about police brutality, but not on the same broad social scale. Uh, so some of this is, is I just part of why there are these 17 factors that you're going through uh, is to try to distinguish and identify the extent to which the way this person does this uh, is is tilting them either in a you know toward a delusional uh, style or is moving back toward uh, rational but extreme. Uh, and again, the the group aspect of this is an issue that I'm still uh, kind of working through and trying to think about uh, that, that, that I really wasn't faced with in the same way in Montfort and, and Nichols. They, they were not sovereign citizens, for example. Uh, in the course of my cross-examination in uh, Nichols, I was asked about a number of groups 
like the Black Hebrew Israelites, because there was a publication that Brian Nichols had in his cell that referenced the Black Hebrew Israelites, um, and whether or not, essentially trying to say, this is not idiosyncratic. See, here is this other group that believes the same thing. Uh, interesting story. Uh, I was asked, this is kind of like a slumdog millionaire moment. Uh, I was asked on cross, Dr. Cunningham, are you familiar with the Black Hebrew Israelites? And I said, as a matter of fact, I am. Now, what the prosecutor didn't know is that I had evaluated the Messiah of the Black Hebrew Israelites as part of his petition to, uh, be, to get early parole because he had cancer and they wanted him to be paroled and also for his, his, his adherence to help take care of him uh, in his uh, uh, decline. And so uh, I knew everything about the Black Hebrew Israelites. Uh, didn't say that, I just said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. The, the prosecutor didn't believe that, said, so tell the jury about the Black Hebrew Israelites. I then turned and talked to the jury for about 10 minutes about the Black Hebrew Israelites and their belief system and how it had nothing to do with what Brian Nichols believed. Uh, so yeah, so there are attempts to tie in that common belief system in those cases. Those, their beliefs are really distinct from more common aspects uh, that were, that were uh, prevalent at the time. Other cases, if you had a sovereign citizen, that's gonna be more problematic to try to, to identify how is this guy different or are we considering that the number of people who have it doesn't change the psychopathology of it? I mean, that's, that's an issue for us to think through. I think you might have just answered because we actually do have several people asking about sovereign citizens. You know, how do you have any recommendations about using this model of sovereign citizens? And then somebody else also elaborates on what you essentially just touched on is that you know there isn't really this organizing central ideals within the sovereign citizens. There's you know there can be a lot of idiosyncratic levels within their beliefs. And so, you know, how can you maybe apply this model or how do you determine whether that's an extreme belief or... Right. Yeah, great question. And, and that, that goes to, I, I think, such an important idea that you don't stop thinking just because what this person believes has some common aspect to it. Just because it's religious doesn't mean it's not a delusion. Just because they say sovereign citizen doesn't mean that the way they hold this isn't delusional. And so this goes back to the idea of don't stop thinking. Just because you get a certain thing, uh, you, you, the, the, there's a certain shared element, don't quit thinking and assume, okay, King's X, they said the word sovereign citizen, we're now off of this, there, there's no delusion here that that this is intended to be a metric to help you think more deeply and systematically about these presentations. Now again, the shared aspect of it is is a piece that I'm still trying to think through and understand and maybe identify some metrics that will help us separate that. I eagerly await that. <laughs> I need it in most of my cases. Um, so we have another question that says, could you potentially give an example of an incorrectly categorized extreme belief? So an extreme belief that was incorrectly categorized as a delusional disorder. So like on the flip side. Well, sure. Uh, Brian Nichols and Chris Monfort, uh, <laughs> the state's expert uh, said, These, this is not a delusion. These are not delusions. These are extreme beliefs. I I think the question is actually reversed. So an example of um, an extreme belief that was incorrectly determined to be a delusional belief. Oh, okay, the other direction. Well, I guess that would the be me. Direction. That would be me in Monfort and Nichols. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I suppose if, if someone said, for example, let's say that, um, Uh, you know, let's say that somebody is a terrorist and they are trained and supported by an organization and their family is going to get $20,000 or a house after they carry out their suicide bombing. Uh, and, uh, and they're a part of this culture 
and this has a uh, you know obvious pol rational political uh, you know extrinsic uh, kind of expression. Um, and you said, you know, anybody who would commit suicide to achieve some political end, that's irrational. Uh, that's a crazy thing to do. And so if that's what you think, that's a delusion and you have a delusional disorder. All things being equal, uh, as I would apply my metric to that, the metric that I've suggested, not mine, I mean, it's actually conceptualized by others that I'm simply borrowing from. But, uh, but I would, would say on the face of it, that is an incorrect analysis uh, because it fails to consider all of these other aspects that point to this being uh, um, political. And so I, you know, I, I don't think the kamikaze pilots uh, in World War II had a group delusional disorder. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think somebody who sacrifices himself in battle has a delusional disorder. Uh, so people do sacrifice themselves or take other people's lives in the pursuit of political agendas that I may regard as irrational. Okay, so next question says, um, considering that delusional disorders are in all of our psychodiagnostic psycho Bibles, like the ICD-10, DSM, all of those, right? What degree do paranoid aspects play a role and are they greater or lesser from type to type? Um, you know, the, the cases that come before us in a criminal arena are primarily paranoid in nature because they involve some retaliatory response. I and mean, it could be erotomanic uh, and, and have a, a, a forensic aspect to it. But uh, the cases that I have seen and thought about, uh, the nature of the delusional disorder has primarily been paranoid with grandiose elements to it. Um, and I think that's the, uh, I mean, historically, I think that's was a significant aspect of the kind of conceptual heritage of this diagnostic entity. Uh, beyond that, I'm, I uh, probably don't know enough to comment. Um, so another person's asking if you have examples of um, some criminal cases where extreme beliefs are present. If you have like some cases, maybe if that's something we can provide that we can email. Um, yeah, let me think about that. Um, Nothing immediately comes to mind, but I can I can look at my files and see. I, I don't have an immediate example that I can give you. Okay, yeah. If you think of some, we can send it along with your slides, okay. perhaps. Um, so the next one is asking about your thoughts on using the term encapsulated delusion to describe a mother's strongly held belief that the father is abusing their child. Do you have any thoughts about... So that's obvious. I'm assuming within a custody type evaluation situation. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe encapsulated delusion is a little too strong a term. I mean, so there is this uh, phenomena that, that arises that you're, many of you have seen aspects of, where in the repudiation of the relationship and the kind of emotional extricating, the other person is demonized and with that, a construct is created of how that is operationalized into something that's particularly malignant that this person is doing, kind of that parental alienation uh, uh, aspect to it. Um, and its own differential of whether that rises to a delusion or whether that is a particularly pathological divorce or post-divorce. Um, 
you know, or whether this is a borderline personality issue where the, uh, you know, the idealization is followed by the profound uh, disparaging and pejorative uh, view of someone. Uh, so, so this is a feature that happens or a, a, a process that may happen in demonizing somebody else and their motives uh, that exist as part of uh, particular contexts like a divorce uh, that haven't, hasn't otherwise arisen in this person's life or that may arise out of particular personality dysfunctions like the borderline or paranoid personality that the person seizes on this data as meaning much more than it otherwise does. Whether that reflects a delusion or not, you'd probably want to apply other aspects of the scale. Uh, maybe not the scale, but this SJP. So I think we're going to do one more question. Um, and sorry for everybody that we did not get to your question. We're just running short on time. So we'll do one more and then I think we'll be done. Um, but so the last one, I think, could you comment on whether the nature of the delusions, so like, for example, bizarre versus non-bizarre, could impact diagnosis in this framework? Right, so under DSM-4, TR, or this, the earlier construct, the, in a delusional disorder, the disorder, the delusion needed to be non-bizarre. So it's like schizophrenia is bizarre delusions and delusional disorder is non-bizarre. There are lots of problems in trying to differentiate what's a bizarre delusion and what's a non-bizarre delusion and where's the line there. So in DSM-5, there's not that differential. It doesn't now differentiate between whether the delusion is bizarre or non-bizarre, uh, in, in part because that uh, construct was difficult to operationally define. As the bizarre, as the in, in terms of, of our metric, though, as the delusion becomes more bizarre, it's more likely to be more idiosyncratic and improbable. Uh, and reflect even greater failures in critical thinking that you're holding on to something that is so bizarre. So the diagnostic task, I think, is easier uh, if the delusion is bizarre. Unfortunately, as most of us are looking at this differential that we're talking about today, the delusion is not bizarre, or it, it, it may be idiosyncratic, improbable, and grandiose. Uh, but is perhaps not bizarre. All right. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Cunningham, for your time. I really appreciate it. This is a really interesting talk. I'm sure and everybody really enjoyed Thanks. it. Thanks. Thanks. It's my really pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity yeah. to talk about this. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. I think we've been on long enough for folks to grab the link. Uh, I, when we have a lot of people who are trying to register, that sometimes it does freeze, so you might want to just give it a minute and try again. Anthony, anything else?